Good morning, everyone. Time for another Tom and Shane podcast. Uh, we're here with you every Tuesday and Thursday, except we won't be here this Thursday. We'll be here Friday, hopefully. So, um, yeah, I've got to go see the tax man on uh, Thursday. <laughs> got to go see my CPA and see if uh, <laughs> we can keep the government from uh, taking everything I have. <laughs> so hopefully. Hopefully that'll That's work. Right. Out. Well, Money Mike tells you that you got, you know, you got to talk to your accountant. I always get the advice of your accountant, right? That's what Money Mike That's says. That's for sure. Yep, yep. A uh, good accountant's worth their weight in gold. So by all means, uh, you got to keep those folks happy. So uh, today we want to talk about the uh, top ten uh, business killing mistakes. Business killing mistakes, Shane that uh, startup entrepreneurs make uh, when they start up their small businesses. And uh, uh, the first one is pretty obvious. Um, it takes money to make money, right, Shane? Oh, absolutely. And that's why when you're working on all these ideas that Tom is bringing you, you need to look at it from a standard of uh, the old and making a decision list, uh, you know, take a piece of paper, put a line down the middle, pros and cons. So today we're going to go through all the pros That'll give yeah. you the heads up to succeed and all the cons and tell you if you don't follow these ideas, why you'll fail. And that's why the first one is so important is is exactly right. M money at the beginning or as we call capitalization of a business is number one. And uh, you have to make certain, depending on uh, most businesses, uh, that you have at least a year's worth of capitalization, meaning years to cut uh, years worth of money to cover rent labor, uh, product purchase, and uh, insurance, and utilities, all the business costs that you've developed in your business plan, and your financial plan, and your marketing plan. So it's, it's, it's a major mistake that com companies uh, make, especially restaurants, because literally 90% of restaurants fail in the first year. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Uh, but uh, yeah, the thing you got to think about is, and, and I think most people when they start out, they underestimate dramatically how much they're going to need. That's right. Um, but what I tell people to do is take how much gross pay you want to pay yourself at the for the year. Let's say you want to make 75000 Okay. So write down 75000 and add every possible expense to that. And that's how much money you need to get started. So yeah, it's a good way of the individual looking at it. But with the information that we talked about at the beginning of the series with the financial uh, statement, income statement and budgeting and your marketing statement, you can fall back on them. And, and based on what you've put in the, there as your expectations in the first year, you'll know what all your expenses are going to be. So you want to be able yep. to cover those. And, and that sounds like a big number, especially, you know, if you're paying anywhere from two to say $5,000 for your, um, you know, if it's, a, if you're a mortar, um, you know, brick and mortar operation on the, on a street corner and you're paying, you know, up to five grand, you know, right there's $60,000 for a year to be able to pay your lease. Yep. Um, it's different than the, we, as we said, in the 21st century, if you're, if you're on a social network, because you can, um, off, offer the uh, products uh, on, on a social media, you, you don't have that cost. So, uh, you know, it depends on you know, the nature of where you are. And, and that's why you're, you know, setting up your marketing plan, your, you know, financial plan and your business plan, your financial plans, your budget. So you, you just want to follow what you've already established is what your costs will be. Yeah. Well, you know, if you're a startup, you're guessing you really are. I mean, you're 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 taking information. Um, you know, if you go to the Small Business Administration or the uh, uh, Small Business Development Center, they have ratios of what a hardware store should make in the first year mm -hmm. based on your population and whatever. Yeah, you know, I mean, they can they can advise you of what you what you will probably need. Uh, the thing is that um, you know, a lot of people think, well, I'm, I'm just going to have to borrow enough to do the business. Well, don't forget your mortgage. You got car payments, you got utilities, you got all those things. And you're not going to be working for somebody else producing income, pay for those. So That's don't right. think, that the, yeah, don't think the bank isn't going to take that into consideration that you have to live while you're getting this business off the ground. Precisely. You don't want to give up your managed lifestyle you've already created to run a business. You you want to enhance your living lifestyle. 
And that's why Tom makes this point, and, and it's so important that you have two, uh, two real uh, costs here. You have your personal and now your business or professional costs. And so, you know, if you've got a mortgage and it's $1,500 and you, you're going to pay four grand a month to rent a building, you know, you're, you're at almost $6,000 to cover both. And so you have to cover both the expenses, your personal and your professional. That's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So, and, um, you know, that's uh, to some people, that's, that's a little scary because you're taking out a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> and am I going to be able to pay yeah, that back? Right. That's the that's, that's the right. issue. Well, the other thing too, if all your expenses are covered for the year, that takes a lot of stress off of you to donate all of your time to your business. Correct. You know that you you've you've already uh, um, you know you don't have to worry about the mortgage being paid. Uh, the money's there to pay the mortgage, the, the light bill, the phone, whatever. Uh, so that is all there. So. Uh, number two, let's go to number two, uh, expecting immediate gratification. That's expecting your business to just roar off the track, <laughs> immediately start pouring, the money will start pouring in, and uh, sometimes that doesn't always happen right away. You know, it may take a, it may take six months before customers find you, or even a year or more before they find you, depending That's on what right. your business is. And, and we've learned this from our own, you know, efforts to create, uh, 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 you know, uh, and reinvent ourselves. Both Tom and I have, are attempting to do that with these podcasts about business. And uh, we did a podcast about politics and money. And, and uh, you know, we do the Saturday show. But th the point here is, is, again, if it's a brick and mortar operation, you know, sure, the, you can expect an immediate gratification because friends and family in the town you're in, they'll come the first week. It, that's going to happen. You know, everybody's going to be happy for your grand opening, bring you some flowers or, you know, come in and spend some money. And, you know, all of a sudden that's not going to happen after a week or two. Right. Um, yeah. if you're online. You, you can't expect even friends and family necessarily to come to your website and buy product the, the first week. And so, you know, what the research we've found, uh, and I think Tom will confirm this is that if you have an online business, you have to expect that a gratification is going to take six to nine months minimum. Yeah, I would think uh, that would be an accurate statement, Dep depending on your business, you know, you know what it is, obviously. Uh, uh, immediate gratification may come sooner <laughs> or later, but you need to be prepared. Uh, don't get discouraged if your business doesn't take off immediately. Um, unless, unless for some reason you go viral, you know, with, with well, yeah. we talked about with marketing and stuff on, on mm -hmm. the internet, how you want to make an effort to create some kind of a virtual image that could go viral and, and people, yeah. not just because of the product, but, you know, just because of the different things that you've done from a marketing standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. We've gone through all this, talked about it over the weeks that we've been on, on our podcast. So go back and, Review them all, see them from the beginning, because that's yep. how this is done, is from the beginning. And and uh, so, you know, we're months into this, and uh, it's been an extraordinary effort, you know, to provide all the information that we have. That's why today's a great topic, because, you know, we have 10 killing mistakes on a startup. Uh, yeah. And they're all important, and they've all been covered, and you have answers to all of these. Yeah, there you go. All right. Next, we want to talk about uh, you got to have a budget. Um, you know, you just have to. Uh, you can't just, uh, you know, open the doors, uh, count the cash at the end of the day and go home. <laughs> you got, you, you, you're going to have expenses. Uh, you're going to have emergencies. You're going to have the plumbing might go south on you. <laughs> you know, your building right. or, you know, <laughs> even if the, even if the building maintenance is their responsibility, you're still down for a day or two or week or whatever while I get it fixed and cleaned up and whatever. So uh, you really need to have a budget with uh, some surplus uh, for emergencies uh, or if a special buy comes along, maybe your supplier comes in and says, hey, I've got some stuff here, you know, that uh, you can sell. Uh, we're uh, closing out this product or whatever it is, uh, you know, we'll give you a deal on it. And there's all kinds of things. But um, you know, you need to know uh, what your input and output is each month. Uh, each week would be better, but at least each month. 
That's right. And and again, a huge difference here. Just to give you an example, I have people I know uh, that have are continuing their day job because, you know, so to speak, you know, if you sing and people say, keep your day job. Ha! Well, they're keeping their day job because the, at nighttime they have set up websites and they're viral with their uh, a couple of business ideas they're wanting to develop. So they're putting in the extra hours after their eight hours uh, to, to maintain their lifestyle and their family and, and hoping that the success of their websites that they've set up or their small businesses they've set up uh, virtually or in the social networking will work. Uh, so the, again, the contrast of costs, which is, you know, predicated on the budget you create against a brick and mortar, which is not one that you can have two jobs, you know, uh, you know, it's a big contrast. And that's why your financial plan, your marketing plan, and, uh, your long-term income statement or budget uh, plan, um, is so important. You've got to follow them. As Thomas said, you, you can't just create them and spend the time researching and creating them and then not utilize them. It would be a big waste. Yeah. Well, it's the same with your business plan too. You want to review your business plan often and make sure that uh, everything is included in there. Uh, make sure that you, um, uh, you know, as things change, obviously, we're going to talk about that in a few minutes, mm -hmm. but, uh, as, uh, you know, those things go along. So, uh, next, we want to talk about, um, and this one's really important, is that uh, failing to push quality, uh, failing to talk about your business as, as being something that is worth something to a customer. Um, this, is, this is a big issue where a lot of people who start out, they don't charge enough. Uh, they're trying to buy the business by being the cheapest, and that's a... That's a that's a that's an express way to failure if you do that justify your quality in whatever it is you're doing if you're a landscaper then yeah talk about what you're going to do what the thing is going to look like uh, at the end and then follow up and make sure that happens exactly uh, word of mouth is always the biggest play in any startup or in any business and we covered this in one podcast about quality and, and the fact that you have to charge what it costs you to put that product out to the public and then cover your expenses and provide you a profit. You, you can't deny yourself a profit in doing this. Um, if, if the pr price of that pr product becomes uh, a, a, an issue with people buying, then you've got to reconsider what, you know, what the plan is or the product itself. Uh, you may need to add to the product list. You may need to subtract and replace the things on the product list that you have. But no company can really su survive as a single product company. Yeah. You know, you had, even, a restaurant, yeah. that's right, even a restaurant has a menu with anywhere from 10 to 50 items on it, which we've covered as well. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Yeah. Make sure that you're, yeah, make sure you're pushing your quality uh, for sure. Uh, next, uh, we we touched on it earlier. Shane did anyway. Uh, the importance of sales and marketing, because you, you really have to, in order for your business to be successful, you've got to identify the correct target market. Who is your market for what your product or service is? Who is the person most likely to want that? and then how to reach them uh, through uh, sales and marketing, advertising, um, whatever means it is, uh, word of mouth, whatever you do. Uh, but the, uh, the importance of that is very important. And this is where a lot of entrepreneurs, new entrepreneurs, they know their business inside and out, but marketing, advertising, and selling are like a foreign language to a, a lot of people. And they, this is a learning process that you're going to have to sit down and really analyze what's going on with your company. All right, Shane? Absolutely. Tom has covered the marketing aspect of this so well. So I'll just follow up on the sales. Again, sales are something you establish in your income statement and your budget budgeting plan. So you have to accept and not deny if you're not generating what you anticipated um, on a week to a week or month to month basis, you know, for the beginning of, uh, for the first three months. Um, if you haven't attained what sales you anticipated, 
uh, you have to look at, you know, what is the reason for that? You have to analyze that. And it's very difficult to deal with because everything that we've talked about and, and uh, we, we need to make this point, especially here, is, you, you know, people take things personal because they're personally doing this. That We understand that. But sales and marketing aren't personal because they don't, they don't they're not about you. They're about your customers. <laughs> so yeah, for sure, you, 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 yeah, that's right. You can't take the, the lack of sales or good marketing personally. You, you, it's more about the, the, uh, uh, your customers, uh, taking, uh, interest in or personally reflecting on your sales and marketing. So it's not a two way street. It's a one way street folks. And you're only going one way, hopefully towards success with the advice Tom and I are giving you. That's amen to that. Hey, if uh, you'd like to make podcasts like this, and who wouldn't? Uh, we use StreamYard uh, to do that. Uh, StreamYard is uh, uh, the program that lets us put all the stuff on the screen that you see and do all of the cute things that we do here. <laughs> pretty, pretty remarkable. So there's a link in the uh, description below after I process the video uh, shortly after we finish uh, that uh, will take you over there. If you want to examine that and see about doing your own podcasts on YouTube, Facebook, wherever. And also if you're uh, watching us on YouTube, Hey, don't forget to subscribe, ring the notification bell. You'll always be in touch as to when we have another podcast and our next one will be on Friday rather than Thursday this week because uh, now I'm going to see the tax man on Thursday. And also, if you're a small business owner and you need some help, uh, well, uh, hey, if you support us, we'll support you uh, with a lot of free stuff, a lot of perks, a lot of uh, business advice and help and uh, all of that. So uh, we'll be more than happy to do that for you. And hey, don't forget TomAndShane.com. Uh, there's a lot of things over there as for, in addition to what we do here. There's videos there. There's articles. There's tips all sorts of stuff like that. So we hope that you will uh, go over and take advantage of anything that's over there as well. So number six in our top 10 business killers for uh, startup entrepreneurs is adapt or perish. And I don't know of a better example we can give you than the pandemic. <laughs> uh, businesses had to adapt to this pandemic uh, or perish. And many did. And many worked weren't ready to uh, a complete shutdown of their business. And uh, so you, you've got to be able to, uh, as we mentioned earlier, when we we're talking about budgeting, you've got to have some, some cash uh, in the, in reserve or uh, a line of credit in reserve or things like that to, uh, to help you out with getting uh, this done. So yeah, it's very important. Uh, you've got to be able to adapt to, uh, whatever's going on uh, in your, you know, what if there's something negative about your industry? Um, you know, how are you going to uh, fight that? So you've got to be able to, uh, you're very, you got to be flexible to uh, make, uh, you know, make your business successful. Absolutely. And uh, one of the most important things about what uh, Tom was speaking to was adapt. And, you know, we always follow the rule of the, the four I's, intelligence, ideas, innovation, and uh, intelligence. And so adaptation as a human being comes from these four I's. Uh, they carry you well. Uh, you need to think about them because all each and every one individually is important. But boy, when you put them together, it allows you to make some type of adaptation uh, to your business so it'll succeed and you can move on. Absolutely. Next, we've got to talk about knowing the competition. Um, you may be um, your, your knee jerk reaction might be to just react to what your competition is doing. It's better for you to be proactive than reactive. Now, definitely, you need to know what your competition is doing. What, what's going on with them? Where are they advertising? Uh, what are they advertising? How are they reaching people? Uh, what are their products and services? How do, you comp uh, how do you compare to them? And these are, the, these are the differences that you've got to point out to your customers as benefits. Because uh, when, uh, you know, when... Uh, uh, when logic and, and, uh, <laughs> when logic and emotion come in conflict, emotion always wins. 
So that's how you beat your competition is playing to the emotion of the customer. What do they need? They have pain. You can reduce that pain or eliminate that pain. That's the key to advertising and marketing is finding the right customer, finding the pain they have and eliminating or reducing that pain for them. That's right. And, and I have a, a great example that I want to pursue with regards to knowing your competition, because this is where when you put your business plan together, price and quality come into play. A, a great example of that is a couple of guys, uh, well, I think about four years ago, started a company on the Internet. And guess what it was? Socks, because everybody goes in and buys these Chinese socks from you know, Costco or wherever they might buy socks and they come in packages of 12, but the, you know, they don't fit them. It's, it's like seven to 12, you know, they, cause it stretches. So they don't have an exact size. So they came up with this idea that they were going to sell online quality socks made from uh, blends and, you know, not just cotton, but blends of cotton and, and, plastic fiber that, that are sold, but in specific sizes, specific sizes. And that quality and that price made the difference in their success. And so, uh, again, as Tom has well pointed out, you know, knowing your competition is important with regards to quality and pricing. Uh, pricing doesn't always win out in the end, but it can give you an advantage. Quality wins out always. Amen absolutely does all right uh next we've got uh you've got to know the small business legal system um you've got to know how and what you can do with employees for example uh we did a video on the things uh seven que or the questions you can't ask uh in an uh interview um you know how to uh you've got to know how to uh fire and or have a hire and fire uh people and uh, also the legal system, um, what licenses do you have to have? What, what permits do you have to have? Uh, if you're dealing with, uh, you know, certain uh, products or services, uh, you may need um, uh, some kind of an inspection of your uh, equipment that you're using uh, in your business. So there's all kinds of legal situations here that you need to uh, that you need to know about. So again, uh, your small business development center, if you can look those up online, uh, score.org, S C O R E.org. Uh, they've got thousand, uh, business uh, people across the country that can help you for free. So, uh, by all means, uh, you can check out those two sources. They're prepaid with your tax dollars. That's right. And so this again, here we go. Uh, the contracts by a viral or virtual business on, on social media or on the internet with a web page versus brick and mortar in, in your town. There are you know, a lot of guidelines depending on your business and licensing and regulations that you have to follow for a brick and mortar store. It, it's an additional cost that you don't suffer if you're online. In, in fact, virtually there are no, uh, none of these costs, uh, even state to state um, with a business online, because particularly in North America, both governments, our federal governments have supported online businesses for the last 30 years and not ha and not regulated them and f and uh, even uh, forced them to pay sales tax, for goodness sakes, where normally you would. Um, obviously, if, if you're a brick and mortar company in, in states that have sales tax, you have to pay it. But again, if you're online, you don't. So you have to follow the guidelines that you learned in putting your, your business plan together and the research you found as to what cost regulations or licensing you need to be online versus uh, the uh, brick and mortar store uh, operation, uh, which is local and state and then federal. And uh, boy, you, so all of a sudden you find that when you put that business plan together, the need for accountants and lawyers and, and additional costs that you may not have going virtual. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. Uh, lawyer, CPA, uh, bookkeeper of some kind, uh, I would suggest a CPA, at least to set up your, your uh, initial business. That's correct. Uh, yeah. Just so that you know what categories to put the money in correctly mm -hmm. uh, for yeah, tax correct. purposes yeah. and whatever else. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is if you're online, for example, uh, if you have an online business, um, 
Google is not going to recognize you uh, without a privacy policy and terms and conditions of your website. So you need to have those two things on there. If you're going to sell stuff, you absolutely have to have a return policy as to uh, so the customer knows if they buy something from you online, how they're going to return it. And uh, so all those things are legal things that you need to think about um, if you're going to have an online business as, as an entrepreneur. So uh, that's just, right. Um, and, and, so, and, you know, we, we use that example when we talk, talked about this, which we have covered in one of our previous broad, uh, podcasts. And we use the great example of Amazon. Um, if, a, if someone calls up Amazon and says, oh, you, the product you send me is the wrong size or, oh, that's right. We'll check it out and we'll, we, will send, we will send you the proper uh, you know, product that you ordered and we apologize. And, and then people will say to them, well, do, do I return this? And I'll go, oh, no, you don't need, there's no need for you to return it. Well, why? Because, two, it's be more, more, there'd be more cost for them having these things returned and then trying to deal with reselling them because most of them have been tried on and they probably couldn't, especially closing, you know, they couldn't resell it anyway. Number two, it's a write off if they don't, if they don't uh, take it back, uh, which is better for them. And uh, they give the, the benefit of the doubt to the customer. And if it's a product that they can re-gift as a present, then that's even better because they'll talk to whoever they re-gifted to about Amazon, giving it to them to free. You know, depending yeah. on how close the friend was that they re-gifted it to. So, you yeah. know, there's a whole bunch of analogies here and, and how marketing can have such a vast impact. Again, brick and mortar on the street. You know, you have to have a good policy of, of taking back product because that brings people back to you. If they know that something doesn't work or they purchase something and it doesn't isn't what they wanted, that they can bring it back. Most cases, companies, as, as we've said, uh, you can return it to them. Um, yep. and that's why even in brick and mortar, in a lot of ways, you may be able to find on your business plan, it's easier as for a brick and mortar operation to order it from Amazon with the policy they have on return products. That's true. Yeah. Also, uh, buying stuff by credit card, uh, as opposed to writing company checks, uh, you've got 30 days to dispute a credit card situation. Mm -hmm. So, uh, by all means, uh, I would uh, prefer you do that. Larry says, good morning, Tom. <laughs> good morning, Larry. <laughs> <He should. laughs> Happy to have you here. <laughs> thanks, thanks, for the, thanks for being here. We, uh, we appreciate that very much. And, uh, well, uh, uh, I will tell you, you're, you're not going to get a uh, refund from Amazon if you don't return the product. So <laughs> make, sure you, make sure you return it. So. All right. Uh, number nine, hiring bad employees. One of the problems that I see all the time is um, uh, startup businesses have talked to their friends about it and whatever. And there's always this um, uh, whatever <laughs> to hire your friends. <laughs> Sometimes it's a good idea. Sometimes it's not a good idea to hire your friends. Uh, you know, if your friends are qualified, I guess that's okay. But, uh, you know, a friend, uh, you, you really don't want your employees as friends necessarily. Uh, you know, you want them to be more acquaintances <laughs> because, you know, if you have, you know, if it comes to the point where you've got to, you uh, you know, discipline them. Friends take it personally. <laughs> Employees take it as, eh, okay, it's the boss. So, um, yeah, so be careful in who you're hiring and, uh, you know, make sure you check uh, the uh, references. They're, they're, they're always going to give you good references. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. You're, they're always going to give you a good reference. So, you well, know, I, I, yeah. I, always, I always speak to the fact there's three parts to your life, your personal life, your social life, and your business life, or your professional life, or your academic life. I mean, however you make your living, um, that, you know, that's part of your life, your social life is, and, and so is your personal life. So time management of a 24-hour cycle one day is so important, and this comes into play on this. Friends are part of your social life and your personal life. They, they shouldn't be part of your business life. They, they just shouldn't. It, it doesn't work well. And the reason is if it doesn't work out well, then they won't be part of your personal or social life either. 
So yeah. it's a very realistic uh, concern uh, is with regards to your business. And the other the other aspect about this is is that friends um, know you personally and socially in, in a different way than they should as you know you being uh, their employer because you know as an employee you do take things personally that the boss or the company says or, or tells you or decides you know what you're going to do including whether you're going to remain with the company that it's a personal uh, you know result at the end of the day because it speaks to your life your, your capabilities and so it's very personal uh, you know business is business personal is personal they don't mix don't yeah. try to mix them it doesn't work out it isn't a good idea not a good idea at all all right, number 10, uh, not pricing your products or service properly. We talked about this a little bit uh, earlier, but I really want to touch on it uh, in more detail here because uh, pricing your products, uh, you you have to keep the doors open. Uh, you can't sell, you can't buy the business uh, from customers. Um, you've, got to, you've got to stress your quality of your products. Uh, they fill the need, they ease the pain or eliminate the pain of the customer. And the the more benefits there are to the customer, the less important price becomes. So when I when I bought this microphone or bought my mixer or bought the, uh, uh, you know, the software and everything to create the program, um, you know, it was the benefits of the products and the services and the equipment that was more important than the price of it. As long as it was within my reach price wise, then, you know, I can I can buy a cross country uh, air uh, airline uh, ticket from L.A. to New York, but I can't buy a Gulf Stream jet <laughs> to take yes, me there. Right. Yeah. So, <laughs> so. <laughs> the benefit has to has to be within reach, but you know I want the best mic I can afford. I want the best mixer I can afford. I want the best uh, you know camera, whatever it is uh, that I can afford uh, in order to uh, put this program on the air. And so that's it. Right. And and look, there's basically four costs for uh, a product for you to sell at a retail price, you know. So the first cost is, of course, the creation, the manufacturing, or the production of the product, wh whether it's food or clothing. Um, that cost is doubled to where it's, uh, the, the cost of producing that product is doubled in price for, for the producer to get a profit. Um, for the sake of argument, we'll say a $5 product, whatever, whatever the widget is. And then he tra he charges t uh, $10 to get it to the shipper. And the shipper takes it and pays $10 for it. And he doubles it to ship it wherever he's going to. So it's $20 when it lands to the delivery guy. And then the delivery guy may charge anywhere from 50 to 100%. But in, we'll say high ticket items. You know, you're, you're, you know, you've gone from five to 10 to 20. Now you're at 40 and then it comes to you, the retail seller, and you have to determine, you know, at $40 for that specific product, how much of a profit you want to add on to it. And all, a lot of retail companies will do anywhere from 50 to hundred percent. And so this is the 21st century uh, trade networking on, on a global basis and how it works, even for something that comes from China. Quite literally, when you're looking at something you buy at a dollar store, literally, it may have cost a nickel in China, but they still charge a dime to get it to the to Shanghai ports. Shanghai charges 20 cents to get it from there to the United States. The, the shipper charges 40 cents to get it to the retail store. Cost the, the dollar store 40 cents and they're charging a buck for it, folks. So the, yeah. w w whether you're buying men's a pair of man's underwear for thirty five dollars or a woman's you know, pair of underwear for twelve or three, th th think in terms of that's how the pricing is of products in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. Well, and also what we're really talking about here is how you price it to your customer. That's uh, correct. And. Let me give you an example. Let's say that you have a 30% um, margin on most of the things in your storefront. You have a 30% margin. If you have a 20% off sale, 
you're going to have to sell twice as much to make the same money as if you never had a sale at all. <laughs> so just to That's put correct. it in perspective, That's just right. to put that in perspective as to uh, your profit margin and uh, how much uh, how much you have to sell and uh, and all of that. So. And, yeah, and look, right now, today, you can look at most uh, brick and mortar stores, particularly clothing stores. And what do you see all the time now? Yeah, I mean, really, 365 days a year, they have sale signs on the front mm. on the windows. And it's 15% to 30%. And you walk into the store and they have certain sections where they have, and it's a draw. You know, mm. not, not everything in that store is, is, is discounted 30%. But yeah. you know, one specific product might be to get you in there to look at other products. So we've talked about this on the marketing side of the podcast. And that's why it's so important because these variations between your financial statement, which is your budget, your income statement, another aspect of your budget, and your marketing plan, a big aspect of your budget, are so important because it's a combination of all of those for you to be able to react and to make sure the price you're, you're putting on your product will cover all the needs you have, including being paid last in the company. Yeah. Well, the other thing, too, is uh, talking about sales. You cannot legally sell a product on sale unless you have sold it at the regular retail price. In other words, you can't you can't bring a product in from outside and say it's 30 percent off. Uh, that's illegal. So don't do it. <laughs> so you can't just put something on sale uh, unless you've sold it at the original uh, retail price uh, in the past. So there you are. All right. All right. Hey, if you missed any of our previous shows, uh, they're, <laughs> they're all on KMMSAM.com. Click on Tom and Jane's podcast over there. Also, uh, we are on the radio every Saturday, 8 to 11 Mountain Time. Click listen live at KMMSAM.com, and that will get you over to uh, see us uh, over there. And uh, so, uh, as I say, our next podcast is going to be Friday uh, rather than Thursday uh, at the same time. So we hope that you'll uh, show up for that and uh, we'll see you then.